American politics has kind of become like a big football game. Yes. Where the, both sides are saying anything that comes from the other side is wrong, and they don't, they don't even listen to it. You, you've mentioned that going out in rural America and talking to them about economic issues, I would say that there are so many social issues and so much prejudice against anything that happens to come from the liberal side would not even be listened to. And how do you, and I think a lot of this may be due to the right wing media and the radio programs yeah. like getting, they're giving free press to all these ideas. How do you combat and how do you solve this problem of just prejudice against anything liberal or progressive? Well, I think that's a, that's a good question. And I think uh, overcoming that would be difficult. But this is what I think you're saying. I think you say to somebody, for example, who's opposed to gay marriage, we use that as an example, you say, okay, look, you're making $22,000 a year. Uh, you can't afford to send your kid to college. You can't afford childcare for your young kid. You may or may not have health insurance, and if you do have health insurance, you're paying too much for that health insurance. Your friend's job just went to China, and your dad lost his job at the age of 50 because he was replaced by somebody who was 22 years of age at much lower wages. So you disagree with me on gay marriage and you disagree with me on abortion. I respect that. But can't we come together to fight for an economy so that your kids have a fair shot at doing well in society? That's the message that you make. Now, the guy may say, well, I, I can't because I am so anti-gay that I, while you're right on health care and you may be right on the economy, and that, that will happen. But I think what I have seen in the state of Vermont my own state where I, you know, I know best, is that people will disagree with me on the abortion issue, will disagree with me on gay marriage and say, look, Bernie, I disagree with you on that. Yep. But I know you're standing up and you're fighting for me and my kids on these basic economic So you issues. think Democrats need to go to places where they've not found votes, where they don't have a lot of agreement on issues, and make the case regardless. Absolutely. This is the old 50-state uh, strategy your former governor, absolutely. Howard Dean, That's right. uh, Howard, was the architect of as the Howard DNC was chair. absolutely right. And the yeah. answer for it is not that you're going to win in 50 states tomorrow, but you're never going to win unless you plant a flag in those right. states. You have states, you know, the, the poorest part of America is the South is the South. And to desert that and not to bring forth a progressive agenda in Mississippi and Alabama and in some and cases even to, even to run candidates. That's right. right? I think, I, I just don't see how you could be a national party and, and, and abdicate a responsibility for candidates. a good part of, of, of the country. Here's what I think. I, I think a lot of the folks in the Tea Party, for example, would be very surprised to know, A, who started the Tea Party, and what the ideology is of the Koch brothers, who in fact funded the beginning of the Tea Party. So you go to somebody and you say, the people who funded the Tea Party, started it, they believe that we should abolish Social Security. Wow, really? They believe in unfettered free trade. They believe that we should end Medicaid, that we should end Medicare, that we should end the concept of the Environmental Protection Agency. They believe that we should give more tax breaks to billionaires. How many people in the Tea Party actually know that this is the ideology of the people who founded their movement? So I think, I'm not going to say that somebody says, oh, wow, I didn't know that. You know, I'm with you, Bernie. Not going to happen that easily. <laughs> but I think if we can make the case that government should work for all of us and not just the billionaire class, that in fact we have to strengthen and expand Social Security, Etc. I think you got a shot to get some of those people. I think the Republicans have done a brilliant job over the years. They're very smart guys in dividing people on a million different issues. They divide people on gay marriage. They divide people on abortion. They divide people on immigration. And what my job is, and it's not just in blue states, believe me, we're going to go to red states, we're going to go to conservative states, is to bring working people together around an agenda that works for their kids and works for their parents, raising the minimum wage to 15 bucks an hour, having a trade policy that creates jobs in America, not in China, making sure that all of our kids can get a college education regardless of their income, fighting for pay equity for women workers. We have an agenda that I believe can bring people together. And when we do that, we're going to win this election very easily, I think. There's so much gridlock and paralysis in Washington right now. Uh, however, I, I think it's important to, to um, 
put it in context, you know, President Obama got a lot done in those first two years. And you know, in my opinion, his leadership helped save our economy from dropping into a Great Depression. The wor we already had the worst financial crisis since then. Something I care a lot about, because I still have the scars to show for it, he got the Affordable Care Act passed, and we now have 16 million Americans who have health care. And, 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 you know, he really did push through a, a lot of important changes in the way uh, agencies operate, the government operates. Um, but, you know, he ran into what is often the reality is that the midterm elections come and the people who voted for him don't turn out and vote for the Democrats necessary for him to continue doing his job. Happened to my husband. You know, when Bill passed the economic plan in 93, 94, my gosh, he took on everybody, raised taxes on, you know, the highest income uh, earners. And then people who had voted for him didn't turn out and vote, and he lost the Congress, and President Obama you know, lost the House. And then he won re-election because people came out again, because it was a presidential year, and they could vote for President Obama. Then, you know better than anybody here in Iowa, it was a terrible midterm in 2014, and we lost the Senate. I say that because people ask, well, what more could President Obama do or what more could I do? And I think those are fair questions. But I also think what more could every American do who cares about the direction we're headed? And so the first thing I would say is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to campaign to elect Democrats and to try to win back the Senate uh, that we lost um, because I know that it will be uh, easier to try to put through an agenda. I'm going to campaign on an agenda like the New College Compact uh, so that there can be no doubt in anybody's mind, this is what I intend to do. And when elected, this is what I will do. I will also go anywhere, anytime to meet with anyone to try to find common ground. I know from my own experience, eight years in the Senate, four years as Secretary of State, and also watching you know, my husband deal with the Congress uh, in those eight years of his presidency, there is no substitute to building relationships despite how frustrating it might be. That's true in life, it's true in business, it's true in anything. It's also true in politics and government. I'm going to tell you a little story. So when Bill lost the Congress in 94, um, the Republicans shut the government down twice. He vetoed their really deep cuts in Medicare and Medicaid and other important programs. And then uh, he had to negotiate with them. But after he had showed, he was not going to give in to them. So for the next few years, Newt Gingrich would be out there on TV saying terrible things about Bill and often about me, nothing new about that. And, <laughs> and then around, you know, 9 o'clock, he'd come to the White House. <laughs> he'd go up the elevator to the private second floor quarters where presidents live. Hi, we'd say, hi. Then he'd go sit down with Bill, and they would start to try to hammer out a principled compromise. Now, I will say this for Gingrich. He actually knew that in order to govern, if you're in the legislative branch, you do have to compromise. Some of the people there now think that they don't have to. It's like, my gosh, it, it, it's just like nothing I've ever seen. They don't believe they have to compromise. They think that they're sent there not to compromise. Can you imagine us even starting our country if at the Constitutional Convention everybody said, no, we're not compromising? <laughs> That's just not the way a democracy works and not the longest lasting democracy in the history of the world. So I will 
I will meet with anybody, and I will look for those places where we can get some, something done. I'll give you a final example. So when I graduated from law school, I went to work not for a big firm or anything like that. I went to work for the Children's Defense Fund. And I was, <clears throat> I, I was you know, incredibly uh, honored to be able to do the work I did on behalf of poor kids, neglected kids, abused kids, uh, kids with disabilities, all kinds of problems. And I was very, uh, very committed to doing something about foster care and trying to figure out what we could make different. So when I was first lady, I, I was still anxious to do something about foster care. And I found out Tom DeLay, otherwise known as the Hammer, uh, had been a foster parent. And so I called him up. And I said, Congressman, would you work with me on trying to make some changes in adoption and foster care law? silence but then he said what do you have in mind and I said here's what I think would help he actually came to the White House did an event with me we never agreed on anything else but I think it's important to put together coalitions around specific issues and somebody I found in the Senate somebody you have nothing in common with 99 out of 100 times you might very well write a bill with one time. And you have to be open to that. You can't carry grudges. You can't get frustrated or discouraged. You can't take personally what they say about you. you know, one of my favorite comments about all of that is Eleanor Roosevelt, who said that, you know, any woman who wants to be in public life needs to grow skin as thick as the hide of a rhinoceros. And so you just have to be ready to keep working every single day. And I will do that, and I hope we'll be able to get some good things done for the country.